It was oh, it was hard. It's like we're in a coal mine, basically, right? <laughs> today, today, everybody, you know, types up their nice little thing on their Mac or whatever, and the classes are way smaller because of the faculty-student uh, ratio, which is really shocking and has changed radically in the course of the last 10, 12 years. Um, here's uh, these numbers really kind of blew me away when I when I uh, looked them up. Between 1998 and 2008. Harvard's faculty student ratio went from 21.6 to 1 to 10.3 to 1. It was cut in half, more than half. Stanford's, you might be wondering, went over that same period from 18.3 to 1 to 8.3 to 1. And it's quite possibly declined uh, since then. Chicago from 19.1 uh, to 10.3, et cetera, et cetera. In uh, legal academia as a whole, it's gone from 29 uh, to 1 to 14.8 to 1 over the course of the last 30 years. So in other words, since the 1980s, per capita law school faculty direct compensation has roughly doubled. Uh, the sheer number of faculty relative to the size of the school uh, has a uh, number of uh, student bodies has also doubled. Uh, you, uh, you know, I, I ran this very sophisticated program on a Cray supercomputer and discovered that that meant that from the perspective of uh, faculty, uh, you know, faculty remuneration, uh, the costs of law school have quadrupled in regard to that piece of the budget. Um, so uh, that's just one piece of why costs have gone way up. There's lots of other reasons as well. Right? Um, I'm going to stop now. I have way, way more to say, but maybe some of these other things can come out in the, in the conversation. Just, you know, short message, cost of law school is skyrocketing, legal market is contracting, especially uh, at the low end, but also at the high end as well. This is an unsustainable business model. It still works at Stanford, it works at almost nowhere else. Right. And I will. I hope before the uh, the, is, the session is over, I have I have a chance to say a couple of things about what the role I think Stanford uh, and, and it has to play in doing something about this might be. But I'll stop now and let Professor Rohde uh, respond. It's not a pretty picture, is it? Um, I I agree with um, in general with with Paul's analysis of the uh, financial uh, constraints that the current system imposes. And I guess I just want to broaden the agenda slightly. I think it's really important now when we have this rare moment, uh, as I think back over three decades of teaching and writing about these issues, uh, how, how really infrequent it is to get the, the students, the faculty, let alone the public, um, engaged with questions about the basic design of legal education and who it's serving. So I think at this historical moment, it would be a mistake just to focus on the financial situation and the business model of law schools, broken though that may be. Um, because there are other issues that really, uh, I think, underlie some of the problems that Paul just described and that also really do require attention from audiences like this one. Um, you're not going to be in a position to fix all of this now, but, but you and your cohorts will at some point um, be the ones who really control the levers here. And uh, what's needed is people who really take these issues seriously after their, um, after their legal education, once they get into positions of power and influence. We as a profession have enormous uh, potential for control over the conditions of our own practice, and we haven't used them effectively in the area of regulating legal education. And two points I'll just highlight um, uh, where I think we've particularly fallen short. One is the accreditation structure, which is driving many of these cost <laughs> increases. We have a kind of one-size-fits-all business model uh, for law schools that requires every school to conform to really expensive requirements that are established by a council of accreditation uh, experts who are composed solely of folks from the profession, uh, established members who have uh, status and financial interest for keeping the current structure much the way it is. Um, what's the result of that? I think it's that you've got graduates who are overqualified to offer routine assistance at affordable costs given the debt burdens that most of uh, students now graduate with and often underqualified in practical and interdisciplinary skills. So you've got a structure that fails to recognize and form what's true in fact, which is that legal practice is increasingly special Specialized. And it just makes no sense to require the same training for a Wall Street securities lawyer and a small town family practitioner. 
Three years in law school and passage of a bar exam is neither necessary nor sufficient to guarantee proficiency even in those routine matters where other countries allow um, non-lawyer experts to provide services at much lower cost. So I think we need diversity in the, um, uh, in the process by which we accredit law schools. We need to permit more competition, more innovation, more options for students to choose schools that emphasize teaching rather than scholarship and that have a much lower cost structure. And we can talk more about what that might look like in the question and answer period. I think we also have to give some thought to the quality of the educational experience. Um, a famous legal realist, Fred Rodell, once said there were two things wrong with legal, con with legal writing. One was style, the other was content. <laughs> and you can kind of make the same critique of teaching in law schools. We use a relatively ineffective teaching method for most of our courses. Here I'm not just talking Stanford, uh, which I think has done a pretty good job relative to other schools to, to innovating here. But the dominant method is a cheap one. It's this quasi-Socratic dialogue that every good study of what's an effective learning strategy for, for adults um, reveals to be not um, a particularly good one. In fact, it's on the bottom tier. Um, we use it because it's cheap and easy, not because it works as well as more interactive, experiential approaches and ones that uh, allow for much more uh, student <coughs> feedback. Um, we also give uh, inattention to practical skills, which are much more expensive to educate for, and we could talk endlessly about what the consequences are uh, of that. We also give inadequate attention to issues of values, legal ethics, public service. We relegate those to a, to a, a single course, and um, most faculty regard responsibility for professional ethics as somebody else's responsibility, which, um, and that kind of minimalist approach really marginalizes the significance of those issues. We pay vastly insufficient attention to a lot of indicators of student stress and dysfunction in law school, some of which um, is a result of the kind of mandatory curves and the grading uh, structure that we have. And the result is quite high levels, uh, even relative to other high stress professional schools like medical school and things like depression, substance abuse, and so forth. Our profession suffers from those um, as well, and uh, over a third of lawyers are estimated to have some problems much higher than the average population. The problem starts in law school, and we're not really paying attention to the underlying causes of those stresses. So, so those are just a few of the issues that I think ought to be on the agenda when we talk about costs, and we ought to be thinking about ways to develop a quality legal education at a much um, lower price than what we've currently got. At. Uh, available on the market right now and I think it's really terrific that as many student groups as you all um, care about trying to do something about uh, all the ways that the current system falls short. So I'll, I'll stop there so we have plenty of time for question. Sure. Uh, so what has caused the inflation in the professor's Talk about that. I'd actually be curious to hear some of the other costs. Um, maybe not in as much detail as you talking about. Well, uh, the the inflation and the cost of running law school has you know, nu numerous sources. I just mentioned uh, uh, faculty compensation, um, both pecuniary and non-pecuniary, is one because it's a it's a it's a large cost and it's a striking one. Uh, I, uh, Brian Tamanaha, who's a law professor at uh, Washington University, uh, has a book coming out uh, called The Failing Law Schools, where he has a rather arresting thesis that to, to point at things like faculty compensation, uh, explosion in administrative staffs, more legal clinics, uh, fancier buildings, you know, all those things, and to say those are the things that are causing tuition to go up is kind of to get the, 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 the causality reversed. His argument, which I think is quite striking uh, and, and plausible, is that, in fact, those things are happening because tuition has gone up. Uh, law schools can charge, they have, have raised their tuition rates at an enormously uh, fast rate, a rate that's significantly faster than the rate that has gone up in higher education in general, which is and where it's gone up way faster than inflation as well, uh, because they could. You know, and, and up till now, they, they, they've been able to. Uh, 
for reasons that have to do uh, both with the way uh, law school education is paid for. The federal government will now allow you to, to borrow literally any amount of money to go to law school. If a law school charges X amount of tuition plus cost of attendance, that's what you can borrow from the federal government. Uh, that creates a, a economic distortions and, uh, and significantly suboptimal behavior by people borrowing way more money to go to law school than, uh, than is justified by the, the likely outcomes. And law schools, because they're because almost without exception in this country, they're structured as uh, technical nonprofits, have to spend that money on operations. They can't distribute profit to shareholders. So that money's got to go somewhere, and it goes everywhere. Um, all of this ends up then in something that, uh, that, uh, that Deborah is, is, is I believe, uh, addressing in her own work, uh, affecting very malignantly this, uh, this whole rankings business where schools end up using the rankings as a kind of quasi-ideological justification for running up their operation costs because otherwise, you know, they're going to slip. Uh, and uh, to do that, you have to get um, you have to uh, you have to to pay attention to prestige, and to pay attention to prestige, you have to buy yourself more expensive professors, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, the I, I think in a way, what it's important to focus on first is this model that you can just keep raising tuition at a much greater than inflation rate every single year for decades and decades, which is what law schools have been doing, rather than focusing on the way that money ends up getting spent. Because it would be perfectly possible, I mean, unless you believe that, that, that all, of your, all of your faculty had sub significantly suboptimal legal educations, which seems implausible, then it should be perfectly possible to run a law school uh, with having to, uh, the students pay tuition of uh, $15,000 a year. That's what the most expensive law schools cost even 30 years ago in real constant dollars. So we're not talking about you know, coming up with cold fusion here or something, right? We're talking about returning to a, a model of, uh, of, of economic uh, uh, rationality that has just been left behind by the distortions of a, uh, of a, a seriously malfunctioning market. And uh, I think the sooner that law schools acknowledge that that's what we've gotten, you know, the, the notion that it makes sense to borrow $150,000 of high interest, non-dischargeable debt to get a law degree right now, at how many law schools do you suppose that actually makes sense? I mean, I would say probably four. This is one of them. But you're all, you know, stay, I've heard, people have told me, and I believe it, um, that Stanford, as an institution, has a, as a, is, is distinct from the Ivy Leagues, right? That it's different from the Harvards and the Yales, because at Stanford, there's a commitment at the at the university-wide level to um, to being disruptive, to not just like and necessarily. Re replicating the existing status quo and the power structure, but to look at things in a, in a way that might actually be discombobulating. So I think Stanford's in a position, I don't want to exaggerate this, but I do think that you are all, as an institution in a position to say, no, we're not going to keep doing this just because everybody else has been doing this. And even though we can continue to do it because, you know, we're Stanford. Right. Um, I think you, you, as an institution and as individuals within that institution, are in a position to really do something about getting this train off the track that it's heading down, which is, which is towards a, a really a catastrophic generational, uh, intergenerational collision. Let me um, just say one thing briefly, because I see a, a lot of other um, hands up. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to underscore the point P uh, Paul made about the difference between law school tuition rates, which have gone up 317 percent, while university uh, education um, increases have only gone up 71 percent in, in tuition. And the reason for that is, I think, partly for what you said, which is that we, we've been able to, to do it. That is to say, our graduates are relatively um, more affluent and have been able to borrow enough to sustain those tuition increases. But I don't think we should totally under, um, underestimate the extent to which U.S. News and World Report really has distorted the priorities of, of law schools. A GAO report that came out um, that was commissioned by um, uh, the ABA and, and then one by the ABA that looked at the uh, drivers of cost increases in law school put the blame squarely on U.S. News and World Report rankings. That was because they interviewed